Hey, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending where you are. I'm Paul Duffenbaugh. I'm the Editorial Director at Metal Architecture Magazine. Glad you've joined us today in another of our Metal Architecture webinar series. Um, today, we're presenting Maximizing Envelope Performance with IMP Integrated Components. It's being brought to you by Centria. In a moment, I'm going to turn over to our uh, speaker, Brandon Kinsey. Uh, he's going to take a couple of breaks during his presentation to handle questions, but he has left time at the end of this uh, presentation to handle, ask your questions. Submit them on the panel on your screen, and we'll field them all at the appropriate time. Um, for those of you who are looking for certificates and AIA credit, all of that's going to be handled automatically. Don't worry about that. Just give us seven business days to take care of it. Um, tomorrow, exactly 24 hours after the end of this uh, webinar, you're gonna receive an email. It's gonna have links to technical information, how to follow up with questions. You're also gonna be having a, get a link to a recording of the webinar, which we're hosting on our website. Uh, so if you wanna review anything, you'll have a chance to review things as well. Uh, but right now, let me introduce Brandon Kinsey. He's a district sales manager for Centria. He's been with the company for more than 23 years, I think, and uh, he really knows his stuff. Um, I'm gonna let Brandon tell you more about himself. I'll bounce off, but I'll be available in the background. Brandon, take it away. Thank you, Paul. Uh, as Paul said, my name is Brandon Kinsey. I am a 23-year uh, veteran with Centria, serving um, uh, most of Michigan, Northwest Ohio, and all of Indiana. Uh, my background is uh, predominantly in construction management, um, <clears throat> and I service architects, contractors, and owners uh, on a daily basis. And that's really what uh, most of myself and 20 other colleagues at Centria do is service the architectural community uh, when you're in design with uh, and using uh, insulated metal panels or non-insulated metal panels. Uh, that's what we do. Um, today, we are gonna speak uh, predominantly about <clears throat> Uh, maximizing envelope performance with integrated components. Now, if anybody has ever worked with insulated metal panels, um, you will you'll know or you should know that uh, there are integrated accessories that are available uh, with these com with these uh, insulated metal panels. and uh, some of our best practices that I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of. <clears throat> I'll get through a couple of these slides. So today our learning objectives would be one, we're gonna look at high definition, high performance building envelope um, <clears throat> and explore the most common barriers to really getting to that high performing envelope. We're gonna look at 10 defining characteristics of an insulated composite panel system, understanding and the key envelope components in, of how we integrate. And we mean windows, translucent daylighting panels, sunshades, louvers, and most importantly, really how do these interface with a support system. And that is a real crucial part that we'll talk about. And finally, We'll look at some several examples of performance building envelope design using integrated components uh, with some case studies towards towards the end. So, Brandon, I, I hate to interrupt, but um, I'm not seeing the slides advance, and I'm trying to figure out whether the audience can as well. Um, I'm still on the the title slide. Oh boy, I apologize. Um, I don't know why it didn't advance. Okay, the last slide reads achieving a high performance envelope. Is that the one you wanted on? Yes, sir. Yep. Okay. I, ap okay. I apologize for that. So, Part one of achieving a high performance building envelope. Well, we, we really need it to be thermally efficient. We have to have moisture control. Uh, the inside occupants, we want their health and safety, of course. 
long-term building, uh, 30, 40, 50 year buildings have to be durable. And if you're gonna own a building for that long, you want low operating costs and you really want a low life cycle cost. I mean, we don't want to repaint, we don't want to recaulk. Um, we really don't want to clean our buildings very much. That's what we talk about with low life cycle costs and how metal panel can, can achieve that. <clears throat> Furthermore, we need really nice clean views of the exterior, quality daylighting, uh, a proper, appropriate ventilation. And by the way, it has to look uh, aesthetically pleasing. We have to give the architectural community something, a palette that they can really truly design with. We have to meet construction schedule, which is more compressed today than ever. And then also there's always a budget uh, that has to be attained to. Some of the most common errors that happen when designing an exterior wall system uh, is poor design engineering. And we talk about that in an air barrier, vapor barrier transition. Um, it transitions where wall panels and um, let's say metal to masonry or metal to glass curtain wall. How do those transitions really uh, integrate? Or how do they, how does that detail really look? And are we really paying attention to that? Are we just grabbing details off the internet uh, and hoping or are we utilizing maybe <clears throat> in-person consultants to really help us with the design? But too often these barriers or these transitions uh, are not detailed properly. Uh, then we have a lack of misplacement of a vapor barrier, a thermal bridging uh, through the window framing where we have dissimilar materials and we, we have cold spots in our window framing, our door units, glass units. <clears throat> And then also the subframing. Who's responsible for the subframing? And is it really the responsibility of the architect to design the subframing? Um, not necessarily. And then when we get into the field, if we step back a minute and we design the perfect wall, every all of our details are correct. Um, it's only as good as the folks putting it up in the field. And what I mean by that is too often we run into construction that the, the, uh, the workers aren't trained properly with the, uh, with the wall panels that they're installing, uh, maybe not the proper supervision, uh, just the simple skill of the, of the labor, putting it on the wall. Um, <clears throat> have they worked with insulated metal panels before? Uh, do they know what those transition details are and who's responsible, uh, who's the responsibility uh, for those details. Time, of course, and then coordination of trades. Again, this is this this slide is just ultra important because you can buy the best wall system out there, um, but it's only going to look as good as the installers that are installing it. And so we run into potential issues because we could have a multi-component wall system, uh, which the architect is involved a manufacturer of, of a wall panel, a manufacturer of a window system. Of course, the general contractor will be there and the subcontractor. But when something breaks down, whether it's the air barrier, the vapor barrier, or we have water intrusion, uh, we end up in a situation where there's a lot of finger pointing. And hopefully, uh, not doesn't lead to litigation, but too oftentimes it does lead to litigation. So, <clears throat> Let's look at the insulated metal panel in its most basic form. What you're looking at here is an architectural insulated metal panel. What you don't see in this picture is a backup wall. Uh, you just see simply uh, the, the two metal piggyback studs and the insulated metal panel going right over the, uh, the top of those studs. Um, and that's by design. Insulated metal panels for the most part uh, do not need a backup wall assembly to keep the air water vapor out. Uh, it is a one-stop uh, shop for wall system. But it does comprise itself of a metal face and liner that is typically G90 galvanized on both sides. It's a rigid foam insulation uh, that binds the two sheets of metal together. <clears throat> the the uh, joinery is vertical or horizontal. There's a variety of thicknesses that are also available depending on our value that is desired. But here's where we, the rubber can meet the road 
in the simplicity of an insulated metal panel system. On the left hand side of the screen, you see a multi component wall system uh, comprised of stud framing, exterior jib board, air vapor barrier, rigid insulations, a variety of Z girts, and then in this case, metal panel that could even be masonry or terracotta. Uh, but there's a lot of pieces and parts in that wall system. It's a lot of details to adhere to. It's a lot of contractors with their hands in the wall. And we're trying to eliminate that. We're trying to maybe remove some liability from the architectural side of the business. And if you just simply slide over to the right side of the screen there, that's where the insulated metal panel can, can clearly come into play uh, with just one, inst one installer, uh, one manufacturer, applying it right over to your stud framing system. It's very simple. And the details uh, can be fairly simple as well. So let's break down what the panel, what the insulated metal panel really is. And uh, here we're looking in section at a horizontal joint. That's a horizontal run insulated metal panel that, uh, if we were looking at it in elevation. But the uh, blue side there is a continuous air barrier. The back side of the insulated metal panel liner is a metal G90 liner. It's usually 26 gauge, and that makes or forms an effective air barrier. It's married into a non-skinning butyl within this joinery, so we get complete adhesion of the air barrier. Likewise, in the vertical joint, it's running across the back. So here, you, this would be a piece of flashing here. Over here would be our stud. And the air barrier, the non-skinning butyl, is married across here in the field with more non-skinning butyl caulk. The continuous water barrier or rain screen, if you will, is on the exterior side of the panel. Water simply uh, hits the exterior face of the panel, gravity pulls it down, slope joinery, and it continues down <clears throat> and, and drains itself out. The insulation, uh, again, the insulation values can change with the thickness of the panels, two inch, two and a half inch, three inch. There's some manufacturers that make four inch thick insulated metal panels. But right there is our insulation plane. And then you'll recognize that the vapor barrier is exactly the same as the, um, as the air barrier was. It's that same liner side uh, skin that's the continuous vapor barrier. Now let's look at some of the types of insulation that get used on a daily basis. And what you see at the top there is a polyisocyanurate insulation. That's what you use typically in most architectural insulated metal panels using a polyisocyanurate. And we get about a R7 per inch. As we work our way down, you'll see that another common building material today is mineral wool. Uh, mineral wool today is used in, in rain screen design for its ability to withstand fire and moisture. But recognize that mineral wool, you need about twice as much mineral wool uh, to, to, uh, for R value that equals one inch of polyisocyanurate. So uh, quite a bit of mineral wool would need to be used uh, to equate to uh, the same R value as, a, as an insulated metal panel. Do we have any questions up to this point that I can answer? Uh, nope, not so far. Thanks very much, Brennan. Okay, great. So there's a couple of ways that insulated metal panels are made. One is laminated and the other is called foamed in place. Laminated is where you're basically hand making a panel. You take the, the exterior sheet, uh, that metal sheet, the exterior face, and you roll form it or you break form it. Uh, into the desired shape. And then you do the same with the liner side material. Then you take a board stock insulation that's been molded and you essentially glue the board stock insulation to the two pieces of metal skins. And you essentially laminate the three pieces of material together. And you can see in the photo there, it, it does a pretty good job 
uh, of, of marrying together, you will see the occasional gaps uh, just where it's not a perfect fit, but it's near perfect. Laminated panels, everybody in the marketplace typically makes a laminated panel in one way or another. Uh, they should be reserved for custom type conditions. Um, and when we're curving panels to tight radiuses, a bull nose, a column wrap, a beam wrap, um, extremely small panels that can't be made in line, uh, maybe a six inch or an eight inch panel, uh, those would be reserved for laminated panels. On the right side is a foamed in place panel. Foamed in place panels use a liquid applied foam. The face sheet and the liner sheet are rolled in place and then a liquid applied foam uh, <clears throat> is fills the gap between the two sheets. And what you don't see there are gaps between the, the uh, sheet metal is, and the foam panel and the foam insulation. It's a complete adhesion, uh, very superior in strength versus say a laminated panel. But those are two ways in which foam panels are made today. So if we look at this wall system in a perfect world, uh, it's really a barrier design. So the face sheet is acting as a rain screen. Um, we have a, a, uh, an upstanding leg up there that's preventing kinetic energy or wind blown uh, water to get into the building. We have the sealants and non-curing sealants to create our air barrier and our vapor barrier barriers on the back side with the liner. But we all know there's no such thing as perfect construction. So somewhere down the line, uh, there will be an interruption in our air barrier, not by design, but by fault sometimes. Somebody in the field may stick their hands in this little caulk up here and create a void. The manufacturer may miss a little bit of caulk at their facility. And now you have a, a void in which air could be, <clears throat> or water could be drawn into the building. So if this is our inside of our building there on the right, We've got negative pressure with a hole in our air barrier trying to draw water up and into our building. So a way to combat that is using a pressure equalized joinery, what you see here. There's a vent hole to the exterior that actually equalizes the pressure, the negative, the negative pressure being brought in from the exterior, from the interior. I equate this really to kind of very simplistic terms of, if you've ever tried to uh, draw water uh, from a straw into your mouth and the straw has a hole in it somewhere. And if the hole is large enough, you will not get any liquid into your mouth because the pressure is equalizing. And that's essentially what this pressure equalized joinery is doing. That is the hole in the straw. So it's a belt and suspenders approach. Just in case you don't have perfect installation, installation, you have a you have this pressure equalization chamber uh, to accommodate so no water gets drawn into the building. When we move, when we talk about insulated metal panels, sometimes we just we think of of them just being maybe potentially boring or flat. And that's sim simply not the case. Uh, architectural insulated metal panels, panels that can be installed horizontally or vertically, uh, also have uh, profiled shapes that are available that you can simply plug in and play with the rest of the uh, metal panels on that same facade. Most of them have the same joint design, so it's simply just switching out one panel for, for another. Another interesting fact is that insulated metal panels can be curved. Um, most of them can be curved down to about a three foot radius. And then always what you should expect is a very tight, clean corner, uh, like you see down in the bottom here of that yellow panel, just a really simple, clean, mitered corner uh, is a natural fit for insulated metal panel. And then the beauty like other metal, just about any finish or color that you can think of can be replicated on an insulated metal panel. So you do have a lot of design freedom there. 
The other nice feature as we kind of move into the bulk of, of the program here is a full line of integrated envelope components. And when we talk about integration, we're going to dive into each of these windows, sunshades, daylighting, and louvers. Uh, they're pre-engineered to interface with the IMP joinery. So there's no added parts and pieces. You'll see what I'm talking about. They feature advanced thermal and moisture protection attributes. And they address the requirements for building envelope <clears throat> to provide views, harvest daylight, and also to ventilate. So the temp characteristic of the advanced IMP system would be design engineering and installation services. And frankly, this is these are services that just don't get used enough, uh, that a lot of manufacturers have uh, sales representatives, uh, dealer installers uh, that can actually help early on in projects. And I'm talking as early as schematics, early DD, uh, to where we can give you rules of engagement of how to keep your design intact at the budget that you're trying to attain. Um, the worst thing is that you get too far down the road with design, uh, there's a lot of hours involved, and then we maybe do a late DD budget and it's over budget because uh, we, can't, we can't match the dollars with the design. And so design assist is a very easy way early on in the job to, to alleviate that situation. Uh, there's a host of engineering services that are available uh, with load span tables, support uh, recommendations. And then there's trained envelope installers that are willing to do budget estimates uh, at the earliest phases of the project. And so again, I would highly recommend uh, utilizing uh, these resources uh, early, earlier the better in your project. So integrated building envelope components. So we'll talk about each one of these here. Uh, we'll start with windows. Uh, but what you'll see there in that window is, and I'll show you a better uh, detail here in a second, but extruded aluminum construction, um, window joinery is fully engineered, as you can see, to, to integrate with the panel joinery itself. There's no receptors or ex exterior extrusions where you're plugging in a, a window into an extrusion into the metal panel that can create cold spots. It's a simple, again, like a plug and play. I'll use that quite a bit, that terminology. Uh, models are available to integrate with two inch, two and a half, three inch wall systems, even a punch or strip stack rail orientation. Uh, factory and field options are also available and they're tested very well. So they can be used just about anywhere in the country. Uh, hurricane resistant option is available. So this is what we mean by the head. And that window head is fully assembled. It's thermally broken. And you'll see here how the air barrier remains continuous. Where we don't have, we're not breaking up the, uh, the window and the panel. The same with the rain screen on the exterior. Uh, the joinery looks very similar. The water will shed down the, the side of the building or the exterior side of the building and down the, down the facade. And interestingly enough, uh, the thermal barrier. So any wall consultant that I've ever spoken to has, has always said kind of the holy grail of the industry is if you can keep your insulation plane of your wall inside or close to the insulation plane of the glass. And that's exactly what you're seeing here, that the insulated glass unit is pretty close to being lined up with the insulation of the wall panel above it. And then finally, the continuous vapor barrier uh, remains the same as well. The sill of the panel, the panel, again, it's on module. So you're using the full joinery, integrates fully with the sill of the window. See that it's thermally broken. This glazing pocket, by the way, is an inch and a quarter. So the architect still has the freedom to design with whatever uh, glass manufacturer you'd like to use uh, to be able to fit in that pocket. There's systems available for exterior and interior glazing. 
And again, I'll just show you the barriers, uh, the air barrier, the rain screen, the insulation, and then of course the vapor. So thermally, how does it compete? And what you see here uh, in these three scenarios, a precast concrete panel on the far left, that's just using a typical buyout window. Now there's no insulated metal panel involved here. What you see if it's zero degrees on the outside, and then we're 70 degrees on the interior of our building, we're really sacrificing an awful lot at this window head. Likewise, if it's a brick masonry veneer, uh, the window is recessed, uh, but very similar uh, detail other than the recess. We're a little bit more on the warmer side, but again, that window head is suffering uh, from that through conductance. Conversely, if you look at the truly integrated window and wall system with insulated metal panel, uh, there's considerable difference. Zero degrees here, 70 degrees here, and now we're com more comfortable at about 48 and a half degrees on that head. These photos will look very similar uh, on the sill. Uh, the precast there, again, very cold on the inside. We gained some, <clears throat> quite a bit actually, on the masonry veneer, again, because we're pushed more towards the inside of the building. Uh, but there, again, we gain another 10 degrees with the insulated metal panel with a truly integrated window at a comfortable 45 degrees on an inside uh, 70 degree uh, ambient temperature. Now, an integrated window is not always used with an insulated metal panel. So that's what we're demonstrating here on the left is that a lot of times an insulated metal panel uh, is used as the exterior skin and then uh, a buyout a separate type window system uh, is also being used and that's what we're demonstrating where you see zero degrees here again we don't have that integration we potentially have a real thermal bust at the head and we're back into the 37 degree range even when we're using an insulated metal panel conversely there on the right similar to the uh, the last or two slides ago, the fully integrated head with insulated panel, uh, 48 and a half degrees. Likewise, the, the sill of the panel um, uh, of the system will read very similar. One thing I'll point out in this slide and the slide beforehand, which the other, when you're not using an integrated system, you will be using some sort of another sight line. This is showing an extrusion that's capping off that metal panel. This could also be brake metal. Usually there's a, a caulk within the brake metal as well. So you're adding an extra sight line to your elevation. Same way up at the head. And that's pretty common. The other problem with, with adding that is the flashing, the sight line, and the caulk, it's another avenue in which the building could get dirty. And we're talking about life cycle and not washing our buildings, but the more exposed caulk, or I just shouldn't even say exposed caulk, but caulks that could potentially leak oils in the track dirt, um, eventually somebody's gonna have to clean that building. So if we can eliminate that by using an integrated accessory, uh, why wouldn't we? A quick look at the jams and the similar results uh, because we have discontinuity of the uh, uh, of a thermal break. Uh, we're over on the insulated metal panel side, thermally broken and considerably warmer. Is there any questions at this point that I can answer? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Brandon. We got a couple of good questions here. Um, I want to take one uh, all the way back to when we were talking about. Uh, uh pressure equalization uh somebody wants to know how pressure equalization works in vertical panels is it the same kind of system as in the horizontal panels which you showed in the vertical panel it really doesn't uh the vertical panel gravity um if you if i don't have a slide here but if, if i could show you a slide of a vertical integration typically vertical panels um when they lock together uh gravity will pull uh, the, the moisture down the side of the building. And when you lock the panels in, 
uh, water really doesn't have an opportunity to get um, drawn in, if, 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 if that makes sense. I'd be happy to answer that a little bit with a little bit more uh, a definition offline, Paul. Okay. Um, but we really don't speak of, of, of uh, pressure equalization in vertical applications as much as we, we do in horizontal because of the gravity pull in vertical. Great, thanks. Um, and another good question here about uh, how, how do IMPs qualify as continuous insulation since they have joints? And are the IMP panels tested to the ASTM E331 uh, requirement that IBC has for water leakage? That's uh, kind of two different questions there. Yeah, I'll address the first one. The first one being um, uh, continuous insulation. There's three ways to be can, to meet uh, the the ASHRAE 90.1 code, if you will. Right? There's one. There's actually to have truly continuous insulation across all the barriers. Um, then there's a, a model in which um, insulated metal panels are, a, uh, are an assembly and we don't use the R value method. We actually use the, the U value, a minimum U value method. And uh, under ASHRAE 90.1 insulated metal panels as an assembly, uh, do meet ASHRAE 90.1. So you're not really, you don't, under ASHRAE 90.1, you don't have to meet the definition of continuous insulation. You have to be in compliance with ASHRAE 90.1. And then the third way to meet that would be using a whole building method where you use a comp check or the woofy and you, you analyze the entire building envelope uh, to meet the minimum R value uh, that would be the third way to be in compliance with ASHRAE 90.1. So um, uh, those are the three ways and insulated metal panels uh, meet that using uh, that second way that, uh, that, I, that I spoke about using the, the U-value method, if that makes sense. That's a big, I'm glad that question came up because that's a, that's a biggie that, that I think is misunderstood in the community uh, an awful lot that it's not meeting continuous insulation, it's being in compliance with 90.1, and there's three methods there to meet that. And again, I have a chart, uh, I, could, I could talk with that person offline, I'd be happy to, if you wanna give them my information. Okay, thanks. Have uh, you got time the, 330, the, the 331 of the water test uh, is a boilerplate test, and most products will meet ASTM 331. The, and including insulated metal panels. I don't know a panel system then wouldn't meet ASTM 331. The problem with 331, and this could be a whole nother presentation, is that 331 allows you to test with a perfect air barrier, right? Meaning, so Paul, you and I could go in our garage and create a wall system, and we could then test it to ASTM 331. But before we did, we would make sure our backup air barrier is perfect and we would essentially pass it. The, the pressures in which you're allowed to pass are, are really uh, quite low as well. Um, the same could be said for the ASTM 330, which is the air test. So, uh, but the short answer is yes, insulated metal panels are in compliance with ASTM 331. I've got a couple more, but if you want to keep going, we can hold those. Okay. So, as far as what you see in this picture, what you don't see in this picture is exactly what I just talked about. You don't see any streaking. Um, it's a very, very clean facade. The, the sight lines are what are intended by the architect um, because those windows are truly integrated. You're not seeing extra flashing um, uh, around those windows. So it's a really, really clean facade. But it doesn't mean that you're limited. So when you speak of an integrated window system, you may think that you're limited in design. Here we're showing a full glazed, uh, uh, butt glazed system. You can see all the, uh, also <clears throat> the parameters of, of a larger window and a smaller window. This one gets a little more complex with full mullions and then also a, a glass or a stacked glass design. Those are all within the, 
the repertoire of an of a integrated Windows system. Moving into the next integrated component, and that would be a sunshade. And <clears throat> these, it's not really the sunshade, but it's the point at where it, it uh, protrudes through the insulated metal panel is where we're concerned about. So here are these specially designed aluminum castings, and I'll show you a detail here in a second. But it provides a seamlessly and thermally broken connection and it keeps, the intent is to keep the IMP air and vapor barrier system intact. And I'll show you how that, that works. But if this was a normal uh, uh, type of uh, penetration through the insulated metal panel without a casting, you would probably see some flashing, may not look nearly as clean, but that's what you would usually see. And unfortunately on the back side of that, the, the liner side, which is our air and vapor barrier, would also be penetrated uh, an awful lot in order to make the connection. And I know I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir here quite a bit about uh, a sunshade. I think we all know what the effectiveness is of a sunshade. Uh, if the shading is from a fixed external device, solar gain through a window can be reduced up to 80%. And then, of course, um, uh, and that's obviously going to help then <clears throat> in the summertime with reduction. In the wintertime, though, when the sun is lower in the sky, it allows for the radiation of the sun to heat up the building through the, through the glazing. Uh, my experience has been that most sunshades are, are used for aesthetics. So here's a really good look at what we mean by this casting. So this casting is pre-engineered and this penetration in the wall panel, yes, we do cut out the face and we also remove the insulation, but the, the liner side metal panel, the, the air and vapor barrier is left intact. This is the thermal spacer to help reduce cold transfer. That gets applied back into the pocket and then this entire casting gets sealed into the pocket there's a couple of through bolts then that hold the casting back into structure. Structure could be a tube type system. It could be a very heavy gauge uh, uh, stud framing as well. Castings usually come in four inch and six inch depth. So it's just a really good example of what you see over here on the right side of the picture. The other nice thing that these castings can do, they're, although majority of the time they hold up sunshades, they can hold up a lot of other types of products. And what I mean by that is signage, could be light fixtures, uh, could be decorative pieces that are added to the building. Um, but here it gives you an avenue uh, to affix something uh, without poking a lot of holes in your air vapor barrier. And of course you have, uh, Tons of options available. Uh, these sunshades, the actual sunshades are by other manufacturers. They're not by the insulated metal panel manufacturers, but you really have your choice. And today it's it's virtually limitless, the aesthetics that you can choose for sunshade. Even the colored LEDs are available. Lattice and modular, staggered holes, penetrations, um, perforations, I should say. So when we look at this photo, um, we're really using an awful lot of, of product here. It's just, notice the, the glass with the, the glass, the stacked glass, uh, the sunshade, of course. Here they opened up the reveals in the insulated metal panel to create a bolder horizontal reveal. Down in this part of the elevation, they're a little bit closer together. So you have some contrast there. We get a little bit more of a complex design in the next couple of, of photos. So we move into the uh, translucent daylighting panels. 
um, you'll you'll see that it's very reminiscent of of, of the of a window system. Um, they are completely manufactured offline and delivered to the job site, ready to fit inside the wall. Um, you see the attributes there, four and five foot width, standard grid, shatterproof, thermally broken, of course. Uh, some of these uh, translucent systems achieve U values as low as 0 0.05 or an R20. Uh, so you're letting a lot of light in and still um, remaining heavily insulated. I like this photo, it shows the inside of the, of, a, of the translucent systems, but along the back here, it's also showing the back of the insulated metal panels. So in a building like this, this is a big recreation building, indoor field house, University of Georgia. Uh, you're actually seeing the backside of the insulated panel on the out uh, that's being used as the exterior material, allowing that panel to, to, uh, to do everything it's supposed to be doing. And like I said, thermally broken, it's delivered to the job site, ready to plug and play with the panels above and uh, below them. So here at the head, uh, pretty simple. And then down at the sill again, uh, very simple type design. The jam, this is very typical jam. This is the same jam type uh, condition you would see at a window system, metal with a gasket. But again, no caulks being used. It's a dry seal system, uh, less maintenance. Here's a school that was that uh, used this type of a translucent panel, a little bit closer up view. The other nice thing about this, when you're using an integrated components like this, this is a fully warrantable system. So when, when we have one manufacturer in charge of the entire wall system there, the translucence and integrated window, um, uh, it's a warrantable wall system. A weather type warranty is certainly available with these types of systems. Uh, this is a Boeing project. Uh, this is where you go and pick up your brand new plane uh, once you've ordered it. So this is the receiving center. And what's really cool about this building is that because of the metallic paint that was used, it really transforms between night and, and the daytime, uh, the color. Uh, here you see the, the translucent integrated panels at work. This is a profiled insulated metal panel that was plugged in in various areas, but just a really handsome design uh, for this facility. And finally, the, the integrated louver. Uh, the integrated louver has been around for many, many years, and it's just been a natural fit, if you will, uh, into the system. Uh, louvers for many years, going back 20 plus years, uh, were always back a house. They weren't very decorative. They were an evil necessity. Um, today, louvers are uh, a part of the architectural design, part of the aesthetics uh, of the building. And having an integrated louver that, that doesn't have added flashings and sight lines uh, is a key part of the aesthetics. And this is how it would look in section. Again, the louver is fully assembled. Uh, the louver can be made to whatever specifications. Again, this is a, a partner uh, louver company uh, that would be making the, the integral louvers. So you could choose uh, whatever louver you needed uh, to your mechanical specifications. But you'll recognize that the details are similar. There's a real trend here of what we've been talking about and how easy the fit is. Again, no extra flashing or caulking anywhere within the system. A very clean jam transition here uh, as we look and plan. And today, this is what you uh, should realize when using an integrated louver. Very clean looking lines. Here at this uh, auto dealership, uh, they store the cars above the showroom, in the parking garage of sorts, and uh, ventilation obviously is needed. So that's why so many louvers in this elevation, but it, it becomes a natural part of the design of the building.
Of course, the louvers can be painted whatever color, a contrasting color, a matching color. And because louvers have become so architectural and being used for more than just being a louver, but for the design, uh, there's a lot of louvers in place today that aren't functioning. And for that reason, the idea of using a blank off panel, you could easily use an insulated metal panel as a blank off panel uh, behind uh, a decorative louver. Here we're showing that, again, that panel that has all the same air and water technology, uh, keeping the air and water out of the building. Uh, the front face could be painted uh, a black or a silver or any color that you wanted. And then we're just simply applying these uh, decorative louvers over the, over the top. In section, this is what it looks like. So we've got uh, the insulated composite backup system here, attaching back to structure. Uh, <clears throat> we have an integral rail that you see here, attaches back. And then that allows us to apply our decorative portion of the louver blades right over top of the rail. Your thermal capacity, your ability, your air vapor barrier can remain intact uh, if there's insulated panels above. And then as we move down, of course, to a real functioning louver, the blades are in the same plane, but now we move simply to a functioning louver below. But from the exterior, it's seamless and very, very clean. And then here's a look again and plan at the jam condition. So this, this project here would be very hard to tell uh, what are the functioning louvers versus the more aesthetic louver. And by the way, these are all louver blades. As we kind of move towards the, the end of the program here, we, it's really crucial that we talk about support systems and how support systems are key into the overall wall design and a support system should be discussed again early on in early design development. It's equally as important as the cho choosing of the wall panel. And the idea of mounting stud framing to floor to, to individual floors and having the floor interrupted uh, really isn't uh, the preferred method of, of attachment. And when you do this, the live load deflection of the floor uh, can really play havoc with the exterior building material. And I say exterior building material because this isn't always, this isn't always metal panel. A lot of times this is exterior jip board, air vapor barrier, insulation, and then this could be um, terracotta, it could be masonry, it could be a variety of materials, a phenolic panel. And the constant moving up and down over many years really wears on the tapes and the wraps. Uh, that are being used to prevent air and water infiltration. We really want to try to get away from that. But if we can't get away from that, and we absolutely have to mount the, the studs to the floor slab, then we're going to have to accommodate for that deflection with, a, with an extrusion. Now, based on the deflection that's needed, a half inch or three quarter, it will determine the type of extrusion that's used. But what you're gaining here is a sight line that's interrupting at every floor. So if you've got a 10 story building, you're gonna see this extra sight line wrap that building 10 times. The other part of this is these types of extrusions are very costly. So you're adding a significant amount to your budget, but they will do the job. And you'll see as the live load deflection up and down, it allows the panels to move separately from the interior live load deflect, deflection. So there is a solution for that problem, if that's the case. So what we really prefer to do is, the last two furthest to the right here, is bypass studs or through tube condition where we actually are mounting the stud framing to the exterior uh, face of the floor, or we're mounting a tube to the exterior face of the floor. And what we're doing here, here's a tube design, 
that's dead loaded at grade, panels, window system, and then it's slot connected at every individual floor and also at the roof. And now we've created a, a mini curtain wall, if you will, where we are not affecting the, the caulks uh, or the functionality of the insulated metal panel on the exterior of the building. So <clears throat> if the window wasn't there, uh, I should mention that insulated metal panels have tremendous spanning capability. So it's not uncommon for an insulated panel to span upwards of eight to 11 feet, depending on wind loading between supports. Um, so <clears throat> we don't always need a support at 16 inches or 24 inches. When, when applicable, I would really advise that you simply use placeholders on the drawings for your support framing and let the insulate or the panel manufacturer, the panel manufacturer, the panel installer, take on the liability for the engineering and the placement of the supports that are directly affecting the wall panel system. So in, in real world, uh, this is a project that was done several years ago. You'll see that uh, the clips are already been installed at the intermediate floor. We're waiting for our tube seal to be installed. Now you see a lot of clips here because there's a window system in place. So it's an integrated window system. And you're gonna need a tube frame or a tube, a through tube at every light of glass. So if we have a four foot wide piece of glass, that's really gonna determine your tube spacing. If you have a five foot tube, uh, light of glass that's wide, five foot wide, your tubes will be roughly every five feet. But there again, we don't have any glass. Uh, you can make two or three of those uh, go away quite easily and let the panel span the eight, nine, 10, 11 feet. These are the types of tubes that are used commonly. It's an oblong tube. It's usually two inches wide by six inches or eight inches deep. If we have a tremendous spanning capability, then we'll go upwards of a, of a 10 inch deep tube. You'll see there that they're, they're dead loaded, they're grade. Uh, they're in place, they're being slot connected. And then you see the beginnings of the window system being put into place as well. But <clears throat> there you see the frequency of the tube again because of the glass. From the back side, then in the vision area, there would be an aluminum cover that covers that tube on the back side in the daylight area. And then this is a, the finished facade. Again, windows, sunshades, tube seal supports, uh, but it's under the responsibility of one manufacturer, one installer. Uh, shop drawings could be done almost uh, at the same time as CD drawings are being done if we worked in the design assist to help expedite schedule. Every panel here, has a name and a place on that building. They're all pre-engineered to fit uh, by elevation. So <clears throat> there's really a means to the madness here. It's very methodical and it will fit, it does fit together like a puzzle. The bottom line here too is the liability is firmly on the, the installer and the manufacturer, and it is a completely warrantable system. Fewer attachment points. We're not penetrating thousands of times with an exterior jip board. Uh, kickers aren't required. Single source responsibility, faster product delivery, faster installation, long-term optimal building envelope performance. So here, as we wrap things up, just a couple of quick case studies. A big end user for insulated metal panels with or without an, a window system or, or an integrated component is retrofit. Uh, buildings that are 40, 50 years old, 60 years old, uh, that have good bones, but are simply showing their age, they're leaking, they're not thermally efficient. Um, they have the ability though to hold up a five pound per square foot piece of metal, insulated metal panel, and you can completely transform a building. So hospitals are a huge end user from a retrofit uh, perspective. And just look at the difference here uh, from that masonry facade to this new uh, modern metal uh, design. Again, increased thermal value, 
Uh, the other beauty of this is that a lot of times the interior side is, is uninterrupted. So business can go on uh, as usual uh, with, with very little interruption to the inside of that building. When we want to talk about being sustainable, uh, what we don't use is being more sustainable. So if we use an insulated metal panel and we're simply putting it over framing without a backup system, uh, then we're not using a backup system. That means we're not we're not bringing uh, gypboard to the job site. We're not bringing air vapor barrier to the job site. We're not bringing mineral wool insulation to the job site. And all the scrap from those pieces and parts aren't going into a dumpster. So the idea of using an insulated metal panel that 90% of them are pre-engineered to fit onto your building, uh, you're already way ahead uh, when we talk about being sustainable. Um, but that being said, insulated panels are, have been widely used in LEED certified buildings. This one here in Niagara, New York uh, is just one of many. Um, 58,000 square foot facility. Um, offices as well as uh, warehousing storage three inch thick imp with a 22 r value integrated windows sunshades and louvers and uh, we played a big part of that or insulated panels played a big part of that and this facility earned a lead gold certification And then finally, here's another big retrofit building uh, in uh, Pennsylvania. And here, you can just imagine the transformation. Punched windows became more of a lineal window design, uh, more of a modern look, more welcoming, very clean lines life cycle, long life cycle of the building because of the reduction of exposed sealants. I will point out that you will see an occasional operable window. Operable windows are available in an integrated window system. I will caution you though, uh, depending on the amount of operables you need, uh, may not be beneficial uh, to the system. So if we're looking at a building that needs several uh, uh, operable windows, an integrated system may not be the most effective or efficient way uh, uh, financially to use, uh, to be used. Um, but certainly the occasional operable window uh, can be in place within this system. And this one here, uh, they're not overusing it, very efficient way. Um, And a result here of the, of the Butler County Government Center, again, enhanced energy efficiency, improved views of the exterior. You can, you can tell back from that punched openings to the more uh, lineal views, long-term weather tightness. And so finally, in conclusion, really, when we think about insulated metal panel, let's think about thermal efficiency. Let's think about uh, the structural capability, meaning it's its ability to span, uh, its air barrier integrity and continuity. I think the best way to think about this is ease of detailing. Uh, insulated metal panels can be very simple to detail. Pressure equalized joinery, as we talked about, the built-in air and vapor barrier, metal vertical joints that are keyed into the back of the panel that are virtually impossible to fall out painted the same or contrasting color. Now, talking about views and daylighting and ventilation, all integral accessories that we talked about today um, that integrate right with the joinery of the panels. And again, we, we eliminate the need for detailing component wall interfaces. One of the very first slides was, how are we gonna detail a, a window to a, a panel? What, what material are we using? Who's responsible for tying the air and vapor barrier together? Um, what about at a, at a storefront system? Or what about at a door wall? Or, um, but we can, we can simplify a majority of this 
by using integrated components when we talk of integrated windows, sunshades, louvers. And then again, don't hesitate to, to lean on your manufacturer, design assist capabilities, engineering surfaces, uh, services, and train dealers nationwide that are ready and waiting to help with detailing and also with budgeting. And we we made it. This uh, this is the conclusion or the the end of of this particular course. So, Paul, do we have some more questions? Thank you very much, Brandon, for a great uh, uh, presentation. We do. We're right at uh, quarter after the hour, but I would like to take a couple of uh, questions if you don't mind. Um, okay. Uh, so, for the integrated windows, um, can they be connected to other materials? And the example here is, uh, can it sit on top of, say, a, a masonry wainscoting? Uh, but have IMPs for the jams and the heads. You that could, way. yes. Okay. We would have that detail. You would be integrated certainly at the head, and then we would right. have a similar jam condition as I demonstrated. Yes. Uh, and and somebody asks, is is there a, a, a cost difference between this and an integrated window window system and and just a conventional window system? There is a cost difference. Um, it really depends on the window. It's kind of a good, better, best. So if you're if you're if you're comparing an integrated window system with the best uh, buyout window, it's probably a push. But can you find non-integrated window systems that are less costly? Yes, you can. Great, thanks. Um, another question about the Georgia Fieldhouse project that you showed. Actually, you showed it again right here at the end. Um, it appeared to be vertical IMPs. Uh, how did the daylighting panels get integrated into vertical panels? The the daylighting, I, I don't know if that photo specifically showed that correct, correctly, but um, it would be more of an extruded piece that sits on top of the panel. Um, so it encapsulates uh, the, the vertical leg of the vertical panel could essentially fall within the extrusion of the uh, of the translucent panel. So the uh, there would be no joinery connecting it. It would be just a flat face of the vertical panel being encapsulated um, by the sill piece uh, of the translucent panel. Same could be said for, for a window. I'm glad they brought that up because you could install, we don't show it very often, um, but you could install an integrated window into a vertical wall panel. And the detail would be very similar, where the, the extrusion encapsulates the sill of the panel as well as the head of the panel. So you still get that uh, that thermal efficiency at the head and the sill. Uh, let me uh, take do one more question here, if, if you okay. some, if you're, you've got a moment here, Brandon. Um, you described a building uh, a, a few slides back that had a number of different size panels and, loop and, and louvers and systems, and you describe it as kind of a jigsaw piece going together. Uh, each panel is, is for a specific spot on the building. Um, so this person's asking, how, how is the building verified to make sure the puzzle goes together as planned? And I think they're asking about how, how the panels are marked and then staged and that sort of thing. Well, that, that's an excellent question. During the shop drawing phase, uh, the installer uh, really calls out, or we call them panel marks, uh, of the panels per elevation. So, um, and then uh, the manufacturer can actually bundle panels by elevation. Um, so they, they know the building marks according, and they cross-reference to their shop drawings. I say the building marks, but the panel marks, and they get cross-reference to their shop drawings to know uh, where the panels fit. Now, are there a lot of similar panel marks? Absolutely. Um, but there's a lot of ones that, that are different as well. What I was getting with that is that um, there's, we just don't make panels that are 20 feet long and cut them to fit at the job site. Uh, there's very little waste involved. Um, so we want the majority of the panels to come to the factory ready to be able to fit on the wall exactly where they're supposed to fit, if that makes sense. So that, that building may have six, seven different panel sizes. Lengths, panel correct. Sizes. Right, okay, got it. Yes, it could, right. But they, they call for reference to shop drawings, 
the shop drawings will have where those individual panels go. Great. Hey, Brandon, thank you so much. What a great presentation. I really appreciate you taking your time and thanks everybody uh, for joining us today. Um, if you want more information, you can go to centria.com. They can give you a bunch of information there. Uh, I think uh, in the follow-up email, I, their uh, email or follow-up email tomorrow, there are contacts for you to follow up if you have technical questions. Um, a reminder that the AIA credits and certificates will be handled automatically, just allow seven days for that to process. That'll be in the follow-up email tomorrow. Um, thank you all for attending. We're doing another webinar October 20th. Um, it's called Metal Composite Material Building Code Fire Requirements, and it's presented by Pollock. Um, you can find all the latest information about our webinar series at metalarchitecture.com slash webinars. Uh, Brandon, thanks for the great presentation. I really enjoyed it. And, and, and all of you for joining. Do, I don't know if they have my email, but feel free to email me other further questions, Paul, or I'll get them addressed. Okay. Fabulous. Great. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate everybody's time. Take care. Bye-bye.